We shall assemble at the mountain. We shall assemble at the throne. With humble hearts into his presence, we bring an offering of song, glory and honor and dominion unto the Lamb, unto the King. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing the song of the redeemed. We shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble at the throne. With humble hearts into his presence. We bring an offering of song. Glory and honor and dominion unto the Lamb, unto the King. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing the song. Appleton Church, good morning. We certainly appreciate your attendance here. Uh, Mother Nature is kind of handing out uh, weather like the Powerball numbers, 15, 58, 42. It's uh, Kentucky spring, so you never know what you're going to get. But we're certainly thankful, uh, once again, thankful that you decided to be here with us. Uh, we want to welcome everybody that's watching uh, from home. Uh, we Each and every week we've got more and more that are taking advantage of that. Uh, I know we got some folks traveling. Uh, kids are out at Winterfest. Uh, they've had a wonderful weekend, I'm sure. Uh, I certainly want to be prayerful uh, on their behalf and uh, pray for a safe trip home. Um, just a few announcements this morning. Uh, first, uh, let me go back to this. Uh, if you're visiting with us this morning, we do have uh, our connection cards in the back of the pew. Uh, certainly fill that out. The, throw it in the plate as it comes around. Uh, we would love to kind of keep you updated on what's going on with this family. And uh, there's also a, uh, on one side of the card, you can put down a prayer request. Uh, we would love to absolutely pray for you and anything that might be going on. Uh, I know we had uh, a few come out last week, so we're certainly thankful for that. So if you don't care, fill one of those out. Uh, prayer request today. Uh, we've got a few new ones and uh, some follow-ups. Uh, we've been asked to pray for Kevin Ensign. Uh, Kevin was recently diagnosed with leukemia. Uh, he is the brother of Carolyn Thrasher's uh, best friend. So uh, I believe he's a, a teacher at uh, Lipscomb University. Uh, so please remember Kevin Ensign uh, in your prayers. Uh, also, we want to be praying for Kathleen Cagle. Uh, Kathleen, as you know, has been undergoing some tests. Uh, she's having some increasing pain uh, with what's going on with her. And uh, unfortunately, she doesn't go back to the doctor till uh, March, so she's got a, a few weeks before she gets back to the doctor for more tests. So uh, please be praying for Kathleen that she can find some relief uh, from her pain. Uh, also, uh, please be praying for Matt Fleischman, uh, his spinal surgery, everything went well. Uh, Jackie said that uh, a lot of the pain he was experiencing has already subsided, but he does have some recovery to go through and quite possibly may be coming home today. Uh, so please remember Matt Fleischman in your prayers. Uh, also, please remember the Helton and Turner families uh, with the passing of Ryan's aunt, Charlene Turner. And also continue to pray for Louis Geiger. Uh, Louis, I haven't seen him yet this morning, but uh, he's been given the okay to run around the house, climb the curtains, jump up on the table, kick siblings, whatever he needs to do uh, to strengthen his legs. So uh, please remember Louis uh, as he continues to uh, get better and uh, strengthen himself. Um, also have a card to read this morning. Uh, Alberton Church of Christ members, my husband and I uh, want to send you a note of appreciation for providing us with the money and gift cards. We needed this more than you know, and we are so thankful for you all. Uh, this is from a couple uh, that we uh, gave some tornado relief to. Uh, there are still folks that are kind of in a bad spot from the tornado, and uh, of course the elders are still uh, working with uh, people that have those requests. 
and I know there's still some money available for that. So uh, please be prayerful uh, for those out there that are uh, actually still trying to recover uh, from the tornado that we had. So uh, please remember those folks as well. Uh, once again, thank you for being here. Uh, we hope you have a wonderful worship. If you're able to, let's stand as we open our worship. Hebrews 10 says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, Visions of rapture now burst on my side. Angels descending bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long can be seated. Before we have our opening prayer, we'll sing, It Is Well With My Soul. <clears throat> when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea Praise the Lord, oh, my 
Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thankful, we're so thankful for the chance that we have to come together and, as a church family and worship you and your son. Father, you are indeed worthy of our, our worship. You uh, created the universe. You created us. You are uh, the, the master of all things, Father. And through your son, we have the chance to spend eternity with you. Father, we thank you for the chance that we have to celebrate that here today and to spend more time uh, in, in your presence, in your son's presence, Father. Helps us draw closer to you as, as we go throughout this worship service, that we may leave here uh, uplifted, Father, and, and that you will be edified and glorified, Father, and that we can spread your your love to our, our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, Father, to the people that don't know you or the people who used to know you and have fallen away, Father. Father, we ask that you will bless uh, our church service. We, Father, we ask you bless the leaders of, of this church, the elders and the deacons. Father, we thank you for uh, the work of our ministers, Stephen and, and Ryan, and we're thankful for uh, their in, their families and just the, uh, the the spirit and the presence that they they bring to us, Father. Father, we ask you will uh, be with uh, all the many who have already been mentioned today, who are sick, those who are dealing with uh, illnesses that uh, maybe they're just starting down that path, or they're dealing with chronic illnesses, Father. Father, we pray you'll be with those who have lost loved ones recently. Help them to find comfort in you, Father. Father, we, uh, we pray for those who are away from us today, who are traveling, especially for the, uh, the youth. We pray you'll give them a safe trip back. But Father, any of those who are, who are just away from us for whatever reason is, Father, we, we pray that uh, they can be reunited with us soon. Father, we, uh, we just thank you for this time that we can join together and that we can be close to you. Father, bless us again. Bless us the rest of this week. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. As we prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, we'll sing, Worthy is the Lamb. <clears throat> Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. 
Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail-pierced hands. Wash me in your cleansing flow, now all I know, your forgiveness and embrace. Worthy is the Lamb, seated on the throne. Crown you now with many crowns, you reign victorious, high and lifted up, Jesus, Son of God, the darling of heaven crucified, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid, bearing all my sin and shame. In love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail-pierced hands. Wash me in your cleansing flow, now all I know, your forgiveness and embrace. Worthy is the Lamb, seated on the throne, crown you now with me. You reign victorious, high and lifted up, Jesus, Son of God, the darling of heaven crucified, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to come together and to break this bread together that uh, represents Christ's body that he gave on the cross for our sins. And we pray that as we take this, we will look back on the sacrifice that was given for us, look at the love that you have for us, look at the the pain, the torture, the shame that Christ had to go through, but also to remember in the end that he was victorious, that he overcame death, and gives us the hope that we have an eternity with him. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we also come together thanking you for this, the fruit of the vine that represents Christ's blood that was so freely shed on the cross for our sins. Again, we ask as we take this, that we take it in its manner pleasing to you, that we're reminded of the love that you have for us and the hope of the resurrection. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you knowing that um, we are blessed in so many ways. We are blessed as a nation just to even be able to come together and to worship you freely here. We are blessed as a, as a congregation, and we each know the, the blessings we have personally that you have given us. Pray that you will uh, be with us and bless this uh, contribution as we now have the opportunity to, to give back and to bless others and to help others as we know you have helped us. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
All right, if you can, let's stand as we sing Days of Elijah. <clears throat> These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword, still we are the voice in the desert, crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, at the trumpet's call, so lift your voice, it's the year of jubilee, and out of Zion's hill salvation comes. These are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant, David rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest, the fields are as wide in your world. And we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, at the trumpet call. So lift your voice, it's a year of jubilee. And out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. You can be seated. Good morning, church. If you want to go ahead and open up to uh, Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 will be where we uh, find our time this morning. All right, there we go. It's good to have everyone with us. Good. I was a little bit concerned that our crowd might be a little bit low today with all the uh, uh, teens gone. And when I first got here, it, it was kind of low, but it seems like it's filled in since since we've been here. So it's good to have so many people with us and uh, so many visitors. And I think I even see some welcome faces back with us uh, today. And so it's good to have you all with us as well, Tyler and Julie. So um, let's see here. Uh, I want to begin by asking ourselves this question. Why study Christ's letters to these seven churches in Asia? Yeah, I think it's important for us to think about these things at times, not just to you know, have a sermon, but also kind of ask, why are we doing this? Why, why are we studying this? Why study Christ's letters to these seven churches in Asia? A few weeks back, I was given a very precious gift. I was given a book, and, and this book is a copy uh, of the lectures presented in 1963 at the Fort Worth Christian College, where the theme was Churches of the New Testament. And this was given to me after I announced that we were going to be working through this and that I was going to be doing this series. It was given to me by Barbara Dyer, and I appreciate her uh, sharing with me. It was part of the library of her late husband, David. And I, I very much appreciate uh, you sharing from his collection with me. And as I was looking through this book, I came across the lesson that was done on the church in Sardis, which is where we are focusing this morning. And I found the opening words of this sermon to be incredibly powerful and, and impactful to what we're doing here. The preacher, whose name was uh, Dick Daughtry, begins with some important words about the value uh, and the impact of the church in the world and why a study like this is vital. These words call for us to, to learn from uh, Christians and churches that have gone before us to, to give great care to the church and to never take lightly the power and the presence that the church plays in, in this world today uh, as the body of Christ. And so as we open this morning, before we are our prayer, I want to read the opening to this sermon preached in 1963 uh, at the Fort Worth Christian College Lectures. 
Mr. Daughtry writes, or, uh, said, God has implemented his ways of righteousness among men from generation to generation through the church of the Lord. Like a deep, swift river, the church has moved ever onward, providing a center of high moral standard and ethical concept. Its influence has swept men, regions, even whole continents along in its force. This mighty stream, consisting of men and women redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, surges forward toward that day of finality, when time shall cease and this river of Christian influence shall flow naturally into the great ocean of eternity. No human organization has ever been able to change so many hearts and lives so dramatically. No other institution in the world's history has vitally related life and immortality to man by God's grace. Such an estimate and concept of the body of Christ presupposes a deep and abiding faith in Jesus Christ. The Church of the Lord is the most precious and valued of institutions to God and his own. Jesus Christ is its head. He offered himself on Calvary that he might redeem and sanctify the church. God has acted in history through Christ and his church. He says a serious study of the New Testament churches is vital. The study can speak to us. Ernest Poole wrote a novel half a century ago. It was called The Harbor. One of the characters was convinced that the past could not teach us. He said, history is just news from a graveyard. But in, unwittingly, he gave a remarkable description of our risen Lord. What glorious news. Christ is raised from the dead and has ascended on high. He has established his glorious church. The results remain with us. We must follow the pattern of New Testament churches. We must abide in the gospel of Christ. The Greek Thucydides, forerunner of the modern school of historians, wrote his history of the Peloponnesian War in the 5th century BC. He explained his attempt to present an exact knowledge of the past, which might aid in the interpretation of the future. We could hardly justify the purpose of this lectureship and our present serious study of New Testament churches in more fitting language. Although we cannot arrive at an absolute and exact knowledge of the early churches, we have sufficient knowledge to show us our duty as Christians. The divine record of New Testament churches was written for our learning. I think that's an incredibly appropriate way to think about this and, and to begin our time uh, together this morning. And as we move on, let's begin with a word of prayer. Holy Father, we thank you so much for these words. We thank you for the record of the churches that have gone before us, for the Christians who have gone before us. We thank you for the way that it guides and instructs us, for the ways that it corrects us and encourages us to move forward. Father, we pray that as we study these letters written uh, to these churches in Asia, that you will help us to find the warnings that, that you give to them and to find the encouragement that you give to them. We pray that we will take these things seriously, that we will strive to be a bride that is adorned for you, Father, adorned for, for your Son. Father, we thank you for the love that you give to us. We pray that you will receive our love in return. We love you so much, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Two young boys stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with each other on the playground. One has been picking on the other, trying to establish himself as the ruler of the playground. His real, his real reputation has actually become the class bully. In the lunchroom, he can, found, uh, he can be found pelting other kids with tater tots and, and dumping spaghetti on their heads, even uh, waving and yelling noodaloo to them as a, some sort of, of way of making fun of them as they leave in tears trying to comb spaghetti noodles out of their hair. He's even worse on the playground where he pulled a large stick out of the woods as if he were pulling the Excalibur out of the stone, and now he's using it to chase and hit kids with it. This is a bully of the same vein as Harry Potter's cousin Dudley, if you're familiar with that series. But when he goes, on, when he goes to pick on a frequent target of his, this time the kid decides he's had enough, and now it's gone too far. Now it's time to step up to the bully. Time to show him that he can't push everyone around anymore. This kid is going to stand his ground and to deliver a message that this bully will never forget. And the message is this. You're not as tough as you think you are. And I'm about ready to prove it to you. Whether it's on the playground, in the lunchroom, in the classroom, in the workplace, or even in the church, 
Sometimes we have more confidence in our strengths and abilities than what they may actually warrant. Sometimes we can get a little too confident. And before we know it, someone or something steps up and shows us that we're not as tough and we're not as great or as invincible as we think we are. You see, sometimes our greatest weakness can actually be that we overestimate our strengths. If I were to ask you what happened during the late uh, night to early morning hours of April 14th and 15th of 1912, many of you would probably be able to tell me that this was the night that the great ship, the Titanic, would hit, the, uh, hit an iceberg and sink. Most of you know this story well, so I won't repeat it in great detail for you, but the long and the short of it is that this ship, the Titanic, was supposed to have been one of the greatest ships to ever set sail. Many thought that this, uh, that this vessel was unsinkable, that it was untouchable. However, in the late night hours of April 14, 1912, this great ship struck an iceberg. And with a few hours, it had sunk to the ocean floor. And this obviously was a great tragedy, uh, but it was also an event that many thought was just impossible. This great ship was thought to have been indestructible, to be unsinkable. As a matter of fact, the, the makers of the ship were so confident in its strength and its inability to sink that there were only enough lifeboats on board to hold about 1,200 people. And even though the ship was not at full capacity, there were still over 2,200 people on board that night. On top of, of not having the proper equipment, when it became evident that this great unsinkable ship was in fact sinking, the crew found themselves unprepared. Not only were there not enough lifeboats, but they also failed to properly test the equipment of the ones that were there. And so they were supposed to load the people in the lifeboats and then, and then lower them into the water. Each uh, lifeboat was supposed to hold about 65 people as it went down into the water. However, because they hadn't run all of the appropriate tests, they were uncertain of the equipment and of its ability to work like it should. And the crew didn't trust the equipment to hold the weight of the boat and that many people. And so the first boat lowered off the ship was not even half full as it carried only 27 people of its maximum capacity of 65. And the end result was that about 1,500 of the roughly 2,200 people on board perished that night. It was a terrible tragedy, but to make things even worse, much of the loss of life could have been avoided if the makers of the Titanic would not have been too overconfident in the strength and the abilities of this great ship. Like I said, sometimes our greatest weakness, the greatest weakness that any of us can have, is that we don't have a realistic understanding of our true strengths. To have too great a sense of pride and to not have received a proper dose of humility. As we continue our study this week of the letters uh, that Christ wrote to the churches in Asia, we come to a letter written to the church in Sardis. And Christ's message to this church in a nutshell is this. You're not as tough, you're not as great as you think you are. And I'm about ready to prove it. And so let's look at this letter together. We find it in Revelation chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. It says, And the angel of the church in Sardis write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is one of the strongest rebukes that, we have, that we've heard from Christ so far. He begins by saying, you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. What brought this rebuke about? What was going on at Sardis that Jesus would say that they were dead? Tim Archer writes that at the time of this letter, Sardis was a city with a glorious past and a mediocre present. 
Once upon a time, Sardis had served as the capital of the, the Lydian kingdom. It was a city that had enjoyed great wealth, and with that great wealth came great power. Beyond being rich and, and powerful, Sardis had plenty of natural protections around them to keep them safe. The city had been built on, on this rocky hillside that rose about 1,500 feet above the plains beneath. And so due to the rocky terrain and the tremendous height, it pretty much had only one way in and, and one way out. The only reasonable way to enter the city was, was to come in from the south. And so using the terrain to protect them from all the other sides, the armies in Sardis would plant almost the entirety uh, of their strength of their army to the south. And due to the great wealth that Sardis boasted, they were subject to frequent attacks, but due to this tremendous uh, natural protection, they were considered to be uh, practically impenetrable. But finally, legend has it that Cyrus the Great had become so frustrated with being constantly defeated by Sardis that he offered a reward to any soldier who could discover an entry route. And one day it happened that one of Cyrus's Persian uh, soldiers observed a Lydian soldier that was patrolling amongst the cliffs. And this Lydian soldier accidentally dropped his helmet, but to the great surprise of the Persian soldier, the Lydian soldier quickly and easily descended the cliff and retrieved his helmet and came back up. The Persian, so, uh, the Persian army would wait until nightfall, and then they would scale the cliff at this, very, uh, at this very point, at that exact point. And as most of the Lydian army was camped out down at the, the southern part of their, uh, of their entrance of the city, the Persians quickly overran it. They won the city over not because of their great military might, but because of the carelessness on the part of the people of Sardis. Their weakness had been exploited. And their weakness was simply that they thought their strength was enough. And if that wasn't bad enough, Sardis would be overrun twice more in their history in this very same way. They had counted too heavily upon their strength and they had allowed themselves to relax too much on their protections. They had relaxed so much that they were pretty much unconscious of any possible threats. And that overconfidence in their strength would prove to be their weakness. I mean, think about this city. They sat high above everyone else. They were rich, they were powerful, and they seemed like they had no weakness whatsoever. From the outside looking in, they looked like the perfect city. But their pride and their overconfidence got in the way, and they left themselves unprotected. Now, it's bad enough that they were like this as a city. But what made matters worse was that what had defined them as a city would also define them as a church. From the outside looking in, they looked like they had everything that you would dream of in a church. But the truth is, while they had a reputation of being this great church, Christ says they were really a church that was dead. And while they could fool everyone else by parading their strengths out in front of, for all to see, Jesus had been the one who had walked among them and was aware of all, uh, that all their strengths weren't as strong as what they thought they were or hoped they were. And what hid behind these strengths was, in fact, a dead church. And so Christ says, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Jesus' rebuke to the church in Sardis sounds much like the woes he pronounced on the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew 23, where he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Just like the scribes and the Pharisees whom Jesus refers to as hypocrites, the church at Sardis was built upon this facade of being religious and being spiritual. And to everyone else, they had this tremendous reputation. And they may have fooled everyone else, but Jesus says, not me. He says, these are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven, and the seven stars. I know your works. He says, I know 
<clears throat> he says, I, I know the truth. You may have fooled others, but, but not me. I have the fullness, he says, of the Spirit of God, and I hold the churches in my hand. I walk among them, and I know your works. I know the truth. I know your hearts. Abraham Lincoln uh, was said to have said, you can fool all the people some of the time, and some of the people all the time, but you cannot fool all of the people all of the time. Howard Winters, a, a, a scholar writing on the book of Revelation, suggested that to this should be added, you cannot fool God any of the time. The whole world saw this church at Sardis as the church. This was the church that would have been looked to as examples for growth. This is the church that others would say, I wonder what they're doing. This, this just working so well. I mean, if they were a, <clears throat> excuse me, if they were a modern day church, they would probably have the best speakers, the best worship leaders, countless church activities, a booming youth group, and they would be the church that everyone else was talking about. They would have the reputation of being alive. But Jesus says those aren't the things that make you alive. Those aren't the things that define a strong church. And that's not to say that any of these things are bad. But Jesus says those aren't what define you. These things are good, but they should be the result, he says, of something else. Not the main emphasis within themselves. You see, Jesus is the Lion of Judah, the Lamb of God that was slain for his bride. And before anything else, before anything else that we do, Jesus desires a bride that has a heart only for him. The church in Sardis had fallen asleep and had started coasting because in their mind, they were doing all of the right things. And because of that, they felt like they were untouchable. They had secured their spirituality with doing all of the right things. But their weakness was they counted too much on what they perceived to be their strengths. And that, was, and that had blinded them to their need to fortify their hearts. So many times throughout the course of, of Scripture, God points to good deeds or spiritual rituals that are being done. They were things that, that God had commanded, things that God desired, but they were being done for the sake of the work itself, rather than an act of worship coming from the heart. And because of that, this was not what God had desired. In Joel chapter 2, beginning verse 12, we read, Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17, For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6 says, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God, rather than burnt offerings. Or remember how Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, he says, I am nothing. And if I, have, if I give away all that I have, and I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, he writes, I gain nothing. You see, God's desire for his church, Christ's desire of his bride, is great works that are driven by a love for him, not great works that serve in place of a love for him. The truth is, you can have a church that's doing many things that from the outside look, uh, looking in, look like they're failing. It can, it can appear to be a struggling church, but if the love of God is there, if they are giving their hearts to God, then the one who walks among them and knows them will secure their name in the Lamb's book of life. There can also be churches that from the outside looking in, they look like they have everything right and they're enjoying great success. But if they've become about the works, if they've become about the things that they do and not allowed those works to flow from a heart surrendered to God, then they may have fooled the whole world. But Jesus says, I know the truth. Once again, this is not to say that there's anything wrong with doing great works. God has called us to do great works in this world. God has called his church to do great things. And there are many churches out there that are doing great things and enjoying great success and are doing so because they are doing these things from a heart that's given over to God. But the danger is 
that we can get caught up in doing the things and forget about sacrificing our hearts. And when we do that, the things that may be finding worldly success can become ways to build our confidence in ourselves rather than to build our relationship uh, with, the one, uh, the, uh, with, with the one with whom we are, are gathered together with in this covenant relationship, with the Lamb of, of God, with the Lion of Judah, as we are his bride. And when we become about the things, we start finding our security within those things. And these things are, are, uh, we are doing become our strengths, and we rely too heavily upon those things. And when that becomes the case, what happens? The danger is suddenly we forget to fortify our hearts. And if Satan can get us as a church and as individuals to care more about what we are doing rather than the heart we are doing it with, that becomes just the opening that Satan needs to sneak in and win the battles of our hearts. You see, Satan is tricky, and he has no problem with letting the world and letting ourselves think that we are winning and think that, that we are strong. As a matter of fact, Satan wants that because if he can get us too overconfident where we, be, where we start guarding our hearts, then that becomes the very place, the very weakness that he will exploit. And so what do we do about this? The answer is we guard our hearts and offer our worship and our service to God from a heart of love, not in place of a heart of love. And that can be a really easy trap for us to fall into, one that maybe we have all individually or collectively been guilty of before, or maybe we're guilty of now at times. And so Jesus issues a command to the church in Sardis that we would, that we would do well to follow also. He says in verses 2 and 3, Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard, keep it and repent. A few verses later, Jesus says that there are a few in Sardis that have remained true to him and have continued to offer their hearts to God. But the majority are in great danger of having their names blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. And to this majority, and even as a warning to those who are faithful, he offers five things that they need to, re that they need to do to return their hearts to God. He says, first, they need to wake up. They were soldiers that had fallen asleep at their posts, and they were not properly guarding their hearts. And so the very first thing that they needed to do was to wake up and realize that they were under attack from Satan. Satan is constantly waging war against our hearts. We can't fall asleep at our post. God's desire is for our hearts. Our heart is incredibly precious to him. So we must continuously be on the lookout, continuously be guarding uh, the, the, our hearts from anything that might try to take us away from God. Secondly, Jesus tells the church at Sardis to strengthen what remains and is about to die. He says, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Jesus says these things that you're doing that everyone else sees as great successes, they're about ready to die. So strengthen them. He says, I still want them. I still want your great works. Don't give up on them. But know that as they are now, the way that you're offering them is incomplete. He says, so strengthen them. Like I said, it's not wrong for the church to do great and many things to offer service and worship to God in various ways. In fact, Christ desires that. But the strength of these sacrifices, the strength of these great works and these services, and the strength of our worship must be hearts that are fully given over to our God. Jesus says that desire that remains in you to keep doing great things, he says that's going to die if you keep doing it for yourself or for the sake of the work. So strengthen what remains by putting your whole heart into it and surrendering it as a sacrifice offered over to God from the heart. Next, Jesus says, remember then what you received and heard. At some point, these Christians in Sardis had heard the truth. If not, then they wouldn't even be in the church. They'd heard the truth, but that, church, or that truth wasn't guiding them anymore. They'd gotten too caught up in, in doing the church work and had forgotten what it meant to be the bride of Christ that was in love with the Savior. 
And so Jesus tells them to return to that truth. And then the final two commands can be wrapped up into one. He says, keep it and repent. Simply remembering what they had received and heard was not enough. Knowing God's word, knowing what they should do, and even knowing the heart with which they should do it is not enough if it doesn't change who they are. So Jesus says to not just remember it, but to keep it this time by actually changing your ways and returning to it. The word he uses there, repent, is a strong word. We tend to see it as more of an emotion, as simply just feeling sorry for what we've done. But in biblical times, this word repent meant to actually change directions, to change course and to get back on the right track. It was more than simply just being sorry, but it's a turning away from one thing to turn towards another. Jesus was calling the church in Sardis to change their focus away from the works and put their focus back on God. Return their hearts to God, and he doesn't say to give up everything else from there, but rather than allow for, they are to allow for all their works, all of their sacrifices, all of their deeds, and all of their worship. I want you to think about this. They had a reputation of being alive, but they were dead. They were doing good works. They were doing great works, but behind it was something dead. And so Jesus says that they could just revive their heart. All of these things that they were doing would actually be transformed into something greater. They would find true fulfillment as they flowed from a heart fully surrendered and fully protected in God. You see, the church in Sardis was caught unprepared because they had put too much confidence in what they perceived to be their strength. What they perceived was, were the things they did really well. They'd gotten really good, hear me at this, they'd gotten really good at doing church. They'd got really good at doing church, and they'd gained a, reputa a reputation of doing church well. The problem is Jesus doesn't want a group of people that just do church well. He wants a bride that has a heart fully committed to him. And when the church begins with a heart fully committed to Christ, it will, in fact, do great things in this world. The church will truly be alive, and it will speak life into a world that is dying. Let's return to the words that I read for us at the beginning from this 1963 sermon by Dick Daughtry. He says, God has implemented his ways of righteousness among men from generation to generation through the church of the Lord. Like a deep, swift river, the church has moved ever onward, providing a center of high moral standard and ethical concept. Its influence has swept men, regions, even whole continents along in its, forth, in its force. This mighty stream, consisting of men and women redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, surges toward the day of finality, when time shall cease and the river of Christian influence shall flow naturally, he says, into the great ocean of eternity. No human organization has ever been able to change so many hearts and lives so dramatically. No other institution in the world's history has vitally related life and immortality to man by God's grace. And so he says, the church of the Lord is the most precious and valued of institutions to God and his own. Jesus Christ is its head. He offered himself on Calvary that he might redeem and sanctify the church. And so he says, God has acted in history through Christ and his church. You see, God's plan has always been to work through his people to transform a dying world for his glory. And so the church with a heart fully committed to God and ready to join in the mission of God already at work in this world will in fact do the great things of God. And so Christ closes this letter by writing, the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Those who respond to the sacrifice of Christ by giving their heart fully to him will find their name written in the Lamb's book of life and confessed before the Father and his angels in heaven. 
Church, this is a wonderful message to us. To realize that there is, is hope for us to do great things in this world. To realize that we can do great things in this world, but it begins not by going and doing the things. It begins by giving our heart fully to God. To responding to the love of Christ, the Lamb of God, the Lion of Judah, by giving ourselves as his bride back to him fully. And so the invitation this morning is for all. It's an invitation to the church as a whole, and it's an invitation to each one of us as individuals to respond to the sacrifice of the Lamb, to give our hearts fully to him, and to begin to do the great things that he has prepared for us. And so if you need to respond to that sacrifice this morning by putting Christ on in baptism, giving your heart fully to God, and living solely for him from this point forward, we're here to help you with that. Maybe you've fallen away and, and you need to repent and, and give your heart back to God. No better time to do that than now. But if we can help you in any way, we're going to have an elder and his wife in the back, or you're welcome to come forward. But whatever your need might be, please let that be known now as together we stand and sing.
and I'm welcome with open arms, praise God, just as I am. I come broken to be mended, I come wounded to be healed, I come desperate to be rescued, I come empty to be filled, I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb, and I'm welcome with open arms, praise God, just as I am. Praise God, just as I am. Well, we thank you for being here today. Thanks, Stephen, for that lesson. Uh, we invite everybody to stay for class immediately following our time here. Hope you can, and tonight again at 5.30. We'll close before our closing prayer with Redeemed. <clears throat> Sweet is the song I'm singing today. I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed. Trouble and sorrow. divine glory glory christ is mine christ is mine all to him i now resign i have been redeemed precious indeed is my savior to me i'm redeemed Happy in glory, someday I shall be. I have been redeemed. I'm redeemed by love divine. Glory, glory, Christ is mine. Christ is mine. All to Him I now resign. with me. Dear Lord, we'd just like to come to you now and thank you for giving us another beautiful day that you have given us to worship. Thank you for sending another wonderful message through Brother Walker. Please, please be with us, Lord, as we go out this week and help us to give us the courage and the strength that we need to spread your word. Please be with everyone that's on the prayer list today. Give them the strength and comfort that they need to get through everything that they're struggling with. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross and give us everlasting life. Please forgive us of our sins, Lord, and please be with us as we depart from here. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Sorry I don't have my helper today. He is in Indiana having a good time with him and his mom and his brothers. Uh, we do have a few birthdays today. I got a message here. Um, Jason Cooper, if you could stand up. Jason. And I think Jason's is today. And then also Ben Brown is today. There he is. 
And then I got Randall Wells. And last but not least, Stella Jernigan. Where's Stella? <coughs> She's back there. <laughs> She's having a good time. <laughs> Who, what's that? Oh, Emma Hill. I did not have that in the app. You should probably add your birthday to the app today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday and God bless you. Happy birthday to you. We're dismissed to class.